Boardwalk Empire is one of the best series in the crime drama genre, and its main character, Nucky Thompson, stands out as one of the greatest anti-heroes. Nucky is a politician whose power in New Jersey is nearly absolute. He's a racketeer with a stake in every illegal enterprise in the Atlantic City area, and he's one of the biggest bootleggers of the Prohibition era. It's fascinating to watch him succeed on both sides of the law, keeping viewers engaged and never bored. But what if I told you that Nucky Thompson is based on a real man named Enoch Nucky Johnson? Johnson managed to combine all of these elements in real life, achieving perhaps even more than his on-screen counterpart. While his life involved less violence, he accomplished remarkable feats that made him Atlantic City's most colorful boss. So, if you want to know the real story of this intriguing figure, please welcome Enoch Nucky Johnson to the other side of the law. Before we dive into his story, let's briefly set the stage. Recounting the history of Atlantic City, where Nucky found his power, is essential to understanding how Johnson managed to be both a politician and a racketeer. The secret lies in what Atlantic City was and how it came to be. Imagine modern-day Las Vegas. Bright signs, luxurious casinos, and comfortable hotels offering any food, booze, and entertainment, legal or illegal. Now transport this experience to the early 20th century, and you have Atlantic City. However, just 50 years prior, Atlantic City was nothing more than sand washed by the ocean. It was practically non-existent. The man who transformed this desolate place into a thriving resort was an ordinary doctor named Jonathan Pitney. He had the vision of building a health resort, but his main obstacle was money. While he could find the funds to build a sanatorium, laying a railroad was a different story. Without a railroad, his idea was doomed, as reaching Absecon Island, where Atlantic City is located, was extremely difficult. The railroad was the only way to bring guests to the resort. Initially, Pitney tried to solve the problem through the state, explaining to authorities how beneficial it would be for people to travel to the health resort by rail. However, the authorities did not appreciate his idea and refused. Undeterred, Pitney changed his approach and turned to New Jersey industrialists. This time, he emphasized the financial benefits. The railroad would significantly cut logistics costs and increase local land prices. Even if the investment in the resort didn't pay off, they could sell the land for more than they bought it, and the railroad would serve their plans for decades. First person who agreed to help Pitney was industrialist Samuel Richards. Together, they raised enough money, and in July 1854, the Camden and Atlantic Railroad was opened. Since Camden was not far from the big city of Philadelphia, Hundreds of people immediately took advantage of the opportunity to visit the new resort. To visit the ocean in one day. However, this was not what Pitney had envisioned. He wanted to create a health resort for wealthy citizens. Instead, he ended up with a beach village where workers would arrive in the morning and leave in the evening on their days off. Fare was still expensive for them, so they spent almost nothing at the resort itself. Additionally, the trains had no windows, making the trip quite an adventure. Investors who had bought land at $5 an acre before the railroad sold their land for $300 an acre after it was built, and they were quite happy with the profits. They were not interested in further investment in the city, and new investors were extremely difficult to find. In 1857, the first economic crisis hit the states, and then the Civil War broke out. Under such circumstances, Atlantic City was barely making ends meet. Things began to improve in the 1870s when Pitney died and Samuel Richards decided to take over the resort. He built another railroad line directly from Philadelphia and reduced prices so even the poorest laborer could afford a trip. Now, not hundreds, but thousands of working people came to Atlantic City for the weekend. The city which had been conceived as a long-stay resort for the wealthy, became a day resort for working people. While these visitors still couldn't spend much money individually, their sheer numbers began to generate significant revenue. Atlantic City started making money not on the quality of its visitors, but on their volume. 
Where there are people, there are investors. Over the next 20 years, from 1880 to 1900, Atlantic City transformed from a beach village into the most visited resort in New Jersey. Bars, restaurants, and hotels sprang up, alongside brothels and gambling establishments catering to the desires of the working-class commuters. The main task of the locals became satisfying the demands of the guests at all costs. Atlantic City even had a saying to reflect this ethos. If people who came to town wanted to hear the Bible, we'd read it to them, but nobody ever asked for it. All anyone wanted was girls, drinks, and cards. The local authorities shared this perspective, realizing that the resort's success depended on indulging the desires of its visitors. In Philadelphia, for instance, drinking alcohol on Sundays was prohibited, but Atlantic City also had a similar law. However, local authorities often overlooked it. Thousands of working people from Philadelphia could freely enter any bar or saloon in Atlantic City on Sundays and drink until they exhausted their funds. The same leniency extended to prostitution and gambling, both illegal but tolerated to attract tourists and foster the resort's growth. As more guests poured into town, brothel and casino owners reaped greater profits. This influx made it increasingly challenging for authorities to turn a blind eye without compensation. They sought a share of the growing prosperity. Eventually, authorities turned into racketeers, demanding payments for operating freely. Over time, the line blurred between the leaders of the criminal underworld and those in legitimate positions of power. The Johnson family entered Atlantic City politics during a period of increasing overlap between law and crime. Nucky's father, Smith Johnson, was elected sheriff of Atlantic City in the late 1880s and held the position for several decades. Due to term limits, he alternated between sheriff and undersheriff roles. Smith's rise to power was facilitated through his relationship with Louis Kuehl, later known as Commodore Kuehl, who connected Johnson with influential figures like Lewis Scott, the county clerk, and Congressman John Gardner, who effectively controlled the city at that time. Kennel, closely allied with Scott and Gardner, acted as their advisor and supporter, positioning himself as the future political leader of Atlantic City. By the mid-1890s, Cunel began to assert more authority, culminating in his dominant role after Scott's death in 1900. Kuhnel is widely credited with institutionalizing regular and mandatory payments from illegal businesses to Atlantic City authorities. Working alongside Sheriff Smith Johnson, they enforced this practice through raids and crackdowns, ensuring compliance from all local businessmen. Thus, Atlantic City came under the dual control of Commodore Kuhnel and Nucky's father, setting the stage for Nucky's future influence. Nucky Thompson himself was born in January 1883. At the time of his birth, Sheriff Johnson already had a son, Alfred, who would follow in his father's footsteps and also become a sheriff. Nucky would later serve as sheriff himself for a time, but we'll delve into that shortly. Nucky's childhood and youth mirrored those of many Atlantic City children. He fished in the ocean hunted turkeys with his father's gun, and eagerly absorbed tales of adventure from local sailors. His education was typical for the time, completing school unlike many figures and stories featured on my channel. The homes in Atlantic City typically consisted of small houses with four to five rooms, and education was adequate for Johnson, who eventually attended Trenton State Teachers College in the state capital. However, after just a year, he decided academia wasn't for him, opting instead to pursue a career back in Atlantic City, where opportunities were ample. Returning home, Nucky joined his father's sheriff's office. Initially starting in a minor role by the age of 21, he was promoted to deputy sheriff under his father's patronage. This upward trajectory allowed him to settle down, marrying his high school sweetheart, Mabel, in 1906. Sadly, their happiness was short-lived as Mabel passed away from tuberculosis only seven years later. 
They did not have children, and Mabel's death deeply affected Johnson, leading him to avoid serious relationships for many years thereafter, according to his friends. After Mabel's death, Nucky threw himself into politics. Whether this was a genuine love or a distraction, he devoted considerable time to his career. In 1908, with his father's support, Johnson became the youngest sheriff in Atlantic City at just 25 years old. It seemed like he had it made, positioned to enjoy the benefits of his father's legacy. However, Nucky was determined not to linger in his father's shadow. Instead, he began laying the groundwork for his own political future by winning the affection of the locals. For instance, he often turned a blind eye if someone stole to feed their family, opting to help them find employment rather than prosecute them. He provided advice to those in legal trouble, offered financial assistance during family crises, and engaged in numerous other acts of kindness. Collectively, these actions crafted his image as a caring politician. In just a few years as sheriff, Nucky managed to genuinely endear himself to the people of Atlantic City. His father, who introduced him to key players in local politics, notably Lewis Conn, showed Nucky that he could wield influence as adeptly as Sheriff Johnson swears. When Cornell was convicted of corruption in 1913, he designated Nucky as his successor. By the age of 30, Johnson Jr. ascended to county treasurer and became the de facto leader of the Republican Party in Atlantic City, a position that wielded significant power in running elections and controlling government contracts. While officially holding the title of secretary in the party, this role empowered Nucky to call meetings, set agendas, and ultimately decide the party's direction. During Kunal's era, the county treasurer's office was a hub for substantial bribes. His own power at the polls. Nucky inherited from Commodore a system of governance where much of his political funding came from bribes and legal establishments. Kunal used these funds not only to secure electoral votes or for personal gain, but also for the city's benefit. He oversaw the construction of a sewage treatment plant, expanded water mains, and established an electric company that provided affordable electricity. Nucky, however, took a more strategic approach. Instead of focusing solely on large-scale infrastructure projects, he expanded the unofficial budget to include personalized assistance. While large projects like a water supply system benefited thousands, Nucky understood the enduring impact of helping individuals with personal problems. He provided aid whether food, clothing, or money, tailored to specific needs. This personalized approach earned him lasting gratitude and loyalty from diverse communities. In addition to his political strategy, Nucky extended his support across ethnic lines. He assisted the Irish, Italians, and African Americans, recognizing and addressing their distinct challenges and needs. This inclusive approach cemented his reputation as a leader who deeply cared for the people of Atlantic City. In those days, he was almost revered, with every neighborhood in Atlantic City featuring a parish named after Enoch Johnson. His effective tactics were evident in how well-received he was. Locals saw him as responsive to almost every request. Nucky's positive image was so strong that for many residents, his alleged activities whether taking bribes, misusing budget funds, or influencing elections, were overlooked. However, beyond Atlantic City, in Trenton, there were concerns about such concentrated political power. This became particularly acute when a Democrat assumed the governorship, echoing a time when Kunal was imprisoned, a fate Nucky was keen to avoid. To safeguard his position, Nucky needed influence beyond his district and to align the Democrats with his interests. His chance came in 1916 when he took charge of Senator Walter Edge's gubernatorial campaign in New Jersey. First, he raised the necessary funds for the campaign. Second, he ensured Edge received unequivocal victory in Atlantic County. Thirdly and decisively, he succeeded in gaining Democratic support. Knowing that Democratic leader Frank Haig opposed their candidate, 
Nucky struck a deal. He publicly disowned his own candidate, Otto Whitpin, and promised that Edge would heed Haig's advice if elected. This strategy paid off as Whitpen lost a significant portion of his support, paving the way for Edge to become governor. In gratitude for his pivotal role, Edge appointed Nucky as clerk of the New Jersey Supreme Court. This position not only allowed Nucky to frequent the state capitol and forge crucial connections, but also strengthened his influence in statewide politics. This strategic move marked Nucky's ascent as a key figure in New Jersey politics. Subsequently, Nucky leveraged his influence to support and elevate governors, senators, and mayors, solidifying his, politifying his political legacy. While Nucky's methods to secure power involved various strategies, the crucial point remains that his successful election of Edge demonstrated his influence and secured his prominent position in political circles. Nucky Johnson's influence at the state level granted him immunity year after year, yet his primary sphere of power remained entrenched in Atlantic City. Delving deeper into how Johnson structured his power system there reveals the methods he employed to secure electoral outcomes. Firstly, Johnson relied heavily on the genuine affection of ordinary townspeople, many of whom were of modest means. By assisting them personally, he cultivated a loyal voter base who consistently supported him in elections. However, relying solely on this goodwill wasn't sufficient for guaranteeing consistent electoral victories. Johnson also employed illicit tactics. On election day, Atlantic City would see an influx of hundreds of commuters registered as seasonal workers in local establishments. These individuals, compensated by Johnson, legally voted in Atlantic City, effectively tipping the scales in his favor. Additionally, Johnson's operatives would visit impoverished neighborhoods on Election Day, offering monetary incentives for votes. Outside these polling places, enforcers would intimidate potential opposition, ensuring compliance with Johnson's directives. Nucky Johnson's control over Atlantic City extended to manipulating election precincts to prevent undesired voters from participating. Despite no overt fraud or ballot stuffing, the elections lacked fairness due to these tactics. By ensuring victory in Atlantic City, Johnson effectively controlled the entire county, where 60 of the population resided, overshadowing the indifferent rural voters. With electoral dominance secured, Johnson wielded influence over every facet of local governance. He dictated appointments for mayor, sheriff, and judges, ensuring compliance with his directives. If outside commissions threatened casino operators, Johnson orchestrated jury selection by the sheriff, overlooked by compliant judges, resulting in acquittals for the guilty. Even the local Democratic Party, previously powerless in Atlantic City, became subservient to Johnson. Attempts by Democrats to reform and curb illicit activities irritated city bosses, but Johnson adeptly neutralized these efforts. He maneuvered local Democrats into becoming mere puppets, effectively extinguishing any challenge to his authority. Before Nucky Johnson's reign, the Democrats had been systematically marginalized from both political power and the associated financial benefits. In contrast, Johnson pursued a different strategy. He negotiated with Democratic leaders, offering them a share of embezzled budget funds in exchange for their loyalty and compliance with established rules. This agreement remained intact throughout Johnson's tenure, ensuring minimal interference from the Democratic Party in Atlantic City's Republican affairs. In essence, Johnson consolidated power in Atlantic City akin to a feudal lord within his domain. Like a feudal lord, he built a retinue and levied taxes. Johnson's retinue was led by the police force, overseen by his brother Alfred. Recruitment into this force was a meticulous process. Prospective candidates were vetted by Johnson's men and then interviewed by the county treasurer before being considered for the role. Thus, Johnson maintained strict control over both political and law enforcement apparatuses in Atlantic City. In building his power base, 
Johnson implemented a rigorous screening process aimed at ensuring loyalty among his associates. This was particularly crucial for the Atlantic City Police Force, whose responsibilities extended far beyond maintaining public order. Officers were tasked with securing payments from illegal operators for Nucky's protection and collecting these dues weekly. In essence, local law enforcement became a tool for Johnson to enforce his will through methods including beatings, intimidation, and obstruction of justice. For instance, individuals seeking employment through Johnson might secure a government position with his assistance, but in return, they were required to pay him a monthly fee. If someone ceased payments, instead of dismissal, Johnson's police would intervene, often resorting to physical force to compel compliance and ensure resumed payments. This practice extended beyond government positions with nearly all municipal employees, except police officers, routinely contributing one to seven dollars per month to the Republican coffers in Atlantic City. Certainly, Nucky Johnson operated akin to a racketeer, despite holding public office, leveraging his position to control and exploit Atlantic City on a large scale. While traditional gangsters targeted specific neighborhoods or operations, Johnson extended his influence across the entire city, using it as a source of wealth for himself and his political machinery. In Atlantic City, anyone seeking to operate as a wholesale supplier, secure a government contract, or establish a casino or brothel had to pay tribute to Nucky. He functioned like a godfather figure where individuals came to him to resolve issues and gain favor. Unlike typical gangsters who often relied solely on coercion, Johnson wielded both carrot and stick tactics. While he certainly embezzled funds from the city and directed money flow to benefit himself, he also reinvested in the community. As mentioned earlier, Johnson assisted individuals in need, helped with personal crises, and supported various community initiatives. This dual nature, attracting wealth from the city while also providing patronage, distinguished him from conventional criminals. Despite his illegal methods, Johnson maintained a complex relationship with Atlantic City, balancing exploitation with patronage to solidify his influence and control. Nucky Johnson's influence extended beyond mere exploitation. He maintained a network of local contacts to monitor residents and provide immediate assistance to those in need throughout Atlantic City. Additionally, he invested in the city's infrastructure, overseeing renovations to the train station and the construction of the country's largest convention center. This venue transformed Atlantic City into New Jersey's premier entertainment hub hosting new musicals, theatrical performances, and attracting renowned singers, making it a year-round attraction beyond just the holiday season. It's important to note that Johnson's actions, which included aiding residents and developing the city, were not solely altruistic, but strategically aligned with personal gain. Assisting people ensured political support and votes, which in turn consolidated his power and allowed him to amass significant wealth through various means, often operating outside legal boundaries. While the exact figures of Johnson's earnings remain undisclosed due to the clandestine nature of his activities, some estimates have surfaced. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, Johnson's organization received substantial sums from illegal operations, $1,200 per week from each illegal lottery operator, $160 from each bookmaker, $350 from each bookmaker, $350 from each bingo game, and $100 from each brothel. This operation extended to numerous establishments with larger figures calculated annually. Additionally, it's estimated that Johnson personally received between $300,000 and $500,000 and Vollers and $500,000 annually from these activities, supplemented by kickbacks from government contracts and other sources. These figures highlight the extent of Johnson's financial operations, illustrating how his dual role as a political figure and racketeer enabled substantial wealth accumulation through illicit means. For wholesale suppliers seeking to operate in the city, specific figures on kickbacks to Johnson were often kept confidential. However, 
A notable example surfaced in 1934, when Nucky received $28,000 in cash kickbacks from Tony $8,000 in cash kickbacks from Tony Miller for the construction of the Atlantic City train station. Like many involved in crime during the early 20th century U.S., prohibition proved to be Johnson's most lucrative endeavor. While precise figures on his earnings from illegal liquor are unavailable, the circumstances suggest they were comparable to his income from other sources, possibly even exceeding it due to the era's rampant bribery. While previous biographies on this channel have often delved into crime in cities like New York or Chicago during Prohibition, many viewers are familiar with the modus operandi of underground bars, where alcohol flowed freely with the cooperation of authorities. In those cities, the operations continued smoothly as long as bribes were paid, but raids and closures were swift when authorities turned hostile. However, Atlantic City, during the 1920s, presented a starkly contrasting scenario. With Nucky Johnson firmly in control and enjoying state cover, he effectively dictated the rules. In Atlantic City, there was no de facto prohibition. Alcohol could be purchased openly and abundantly before Prohibition's bars, cafes, restaurants, hotels, nightclubs, grocery stores, and even drugstores proudly displayed their liquor offerings. Nucky Johnson, naturally, was the chief supplier of alcohol to thirsty tourists and residents alike, consolidating his influence over the city's nightlife and economy. Certainly, during Prohibition, Atlantic City, under Nucky Johnson's control, operated a sophisticated smuggling operation. Ships laden with contraband anchored just outside Hughes' waters, where Johnson's associates used speedboats to ferry liquor back to shore. This illicit trade involved almost every facet of city governance. Police clashed with uncooperative Coast Guard members, often framing them for severe charges to maintain control. Even firefighters participated, aiding in unloading smuggled goods near their stations. This coordinated effort ensured that illicit alcohol swiftly reached Atlantic City's eager buyers, highlighting Johnson's pervasive influence over the city's underground economy during this era. Certainly, Enoch Johnson's influence extended far beyond merely importing alcohol during Prohibition. While he didn't engage directly in local production, Unlike characters in TV series who set up distilleries, Johnson opted to take a cut from others operating in his domain. This approach ensured that Atlantic City, bolstered by its status as a premier resort, maintained a steady supply of illicit alcohol to cater to the influx of tourists eager to spend freely. For Johnson's connections with other bootleggers, gangsters and mobsters, his network spanned from Atlantic City to New York and Chicago, forming a complex web of relationships that facilitated the flow of illegal goods and cemented his role as a key figure in prohibition. Air organized crime. All the speculation about a unified network of gangsters across the country traces back to an event in 1929, a supposed nationwide convention of major U.S. gang leaders in Atlantic City. However, historical records clarify that there was no such national gathering. Instead, it was a local meeting involving Chicago gang leaders seeking to negotiate peace on neutral ground. This misunderstanding evolved over time into the myth of a grand convention. The idea that Enoch Johnson was deeply entrenched in the highest levels of organized crime stemmed largely from a misconception. If he had hosted or attended such a meeting, it would imply extensive connections within the criminal underworld across the United States. However, lacking evidence of such a convention, questions arise about the breadth of Johnson's national criminal ties during that era. Regarding connections, I couldn't find specific information on whether Johnson had ties to criminal circles in New York, Detroit, Cleveland, or personal acquaintances like Rothstein, Luciano, or Lansky, as portrayed in some shows. However, Johnson did have dealings with the Torio. Capone Organization from Chicago Initially, his partner John D'Agostino facilitated these connections, and Johnson personally met Torio and Capone at a Dempsey 
Carpentier boxing match in 1921. This encounter marked the beginning of a lasting collaboration. After Prohibition, Johnson and Torrio even jointly purchased a large brewery. Capone held Johnson in such high regard that he chose Atlantic City for a peaceful conference among Chicago gangs. If you have any insights or facts about Johnson's connections to other cities' criminal communities, I'd appreciate reading them in the comments. Moving forward, let's discuss a bit about Johnson's personal life outside of his business dealings. A man who earned approximately $500,000 a year, equivalent to nearly $9 million today, and wielded significant influence in the tourist center of the United States, likely didn't lead an entirely ordinary life, especially during the Roaring Twenties. Johnson's day typically began in the afternoon when he woke up in his luxurious room at the Ritz Hotel, where coffee awaited him upon awakening. He would then proceed to his office, where breakfast and reports from his subordinates awaited him. Alternately listening to racketeers and politicians, Nucky would handle his affairs and quickly scan the morning news. By 4 p.m., his hotel reception was over. Johnson, dressed in one of his hundreds of custom-made suits with a red carnation pinned on it, would venture out to the waterfront for his daily stroll. Here, beggars and people seeking assistance would await him, knowing they could find Nucky there. Enoch would attentively listen to their concerns and do what he could to help, typically spending an hour or two engaged in these activities. Afterward, he would return to the hotel and go swimming in the pool, maintaining his physical fitness. Once done with his exercises, Nucky would attend an evening event, which varied each time, from dinner parties or nightclub gatherings to political meetings. He often returned home in the early morning hours accompanied by a woman of easy virtue, whom his driver discreetly escorted into the hotel before dawn. This routine epitomized Johnson's typical day. As for his social life, money flowed freely at his parties, akin to confetti from a firecracker. The New York Nightlife Observer described him at the time. Nucky liked to visit New York during Atlantic City's off-season. He's one of the city's most carefree spenders, always surrounded by a retinue, mostly female, whom he takes from one nightclub to another, footing all the bills. It's not uncommon for him to slip a $20 bill for an extra napkin or leave a $100 tip. Nucky's popularity in New York's restaurants and nightclubs was such that the waiters' union considered him a frequent and generous patron, even making him an honorary member. Johnson loved to indulge himself and his entourage, whether by buying entire rows at baseball games or boxing matches, or by hosting extravagant parties in Atlantic City that spanned entire weekends. Whenever a star visited his city, Johnson spared no expense in throwing lavish parties in their honor, embodying the prosperity and entertainment spirit of Atlantic City during the 1920s and 30s. He lived a life where he did practically whatever he pleased without consequences. Election fraud, bribes, kickbacks, bootlegging, and dealings with the underworld sustained him for over two decades. Like a modern-day Great Gatsby, Johnson continually expanded his influence and wealth. However, with each passing year, his activities grew louder, attracting bigger threats who eyed him as a prime target. Despite facing scrutiny and legal challenges from early in his career, as sheriff under Commodore Kuhl, in the 1910s, Nucky Johnson continued to wield political influence. He played a key role in helping Republican Lewis in his bid for governor of New Jersey, although Lewis ultimately lost to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Suspicious of irregularities in Atlantic County, Wilson initiated investigations that implicated Cunell and his associates, including Nucky. However, the case against them faltered within Atlantic City's judicial system, allowing Johnson to evade serious consequences. Wilson's persistence eventually led to Kennel's imprisonment on charges related to conflicts of interest involving Atlantic City's water resources. Meanwhile, Johnson faced renewed scrutiny when he supported Hamilton Keene's senatorial campaign, allegedly exceeding campaign spending limits. Despite investigations by a special committee, no conclusive evidence was found to incriminate Johnson, 
and Keene went on to serve as senator. Senator Keene and Nucky Johnson resumed their shady activities until everything changed dramatically the third time. This time, Johnson was pursued not by a governor or a special committee, but by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States. You may wonder why Roosevelt felt the need to bring down Nookie. There were several reasons for this. First of all, Roosevelt came to power when the country was still reeling from the effects of the Great Depression. Atlantic City at the time was a run-down place sustained solely by illegal establishments like casinos and brothels, which transformed the city's entertainment glory into a branded vice city. Shutting down whoever controlled this hotbed of lust and gambling would have been a good peer move for the Roosevelt administration. Secondly, as those close to the 32nd president recalled, Roosevelt had an extreme dislike for politicians he could not fully control, and Johnson was just such a man. Lastly, several people around the president had a personal grudge against Nookie, including Woodrow Wilson, a close friend of Roosevelt. As governor of New Jersey, Roosevelt had put Commodore Cunill behind bars, believing he had decapitated the corrupt Republican clique of Atlantic City. In reality, he only made room for a new leader. Johnson. Wilson realized this too late, when his terms as governor and president were behind him, so he encouraged Roosevelt to deal with Nucky. The second person who planted this idea in the president's mind was his comrade and newspaper magnate, William Hearst. Johnson had stolen a girl from Hearst in the late 1920s while in Atlantic City. The newspaper mogul held a huge grudge against Enoch, and, when his friend became president, decided that he could help him avenge his wounded pride. As you can see, the idea of taking down Nucky was embedded in Roosevelt's brain, much like in Nolan's movie Inception. This is why Ayers and FBI agents, led by Special Agent William Frank, arrived in Atlantic City in November 1936, with orders to put Enoch Johnson in jail by any legal means necessary, no matter how long it took. The Ayers immediately began scrutinizing all of Nucky's returns, reconciling them with his spending. Despite the fact that Enoch lived in a luxury hotel room, had his own fleet of cars, and dined at expensive restaurants, they could not find anything incriminating. His official income covered his expenses, making it impossible to put him away quickly. As a result, the agents prepared for a prolonged battle. The new strategy was to work with the FBI to uncover Johnson's illicit proceeds in the form of bribes or kickbacks and build a case against him. For four long years, agents tried to nail everyone associated with Nucky, from casino and brothel owners to those involved with him in the theft of budget money. Many were sent to prison, but refused to talk. It wasn't until 1940 that they found two weak links. Ralph Falav agreed to testify about paying Johnson to protect his illegal lottery, and Joseph Corio testified about how Nucky received kickbacks for building the train station. Leaders of the Atlantic City underworld suggested that Johnson remove the witnesses so that the authorities would have nothing to build their case on. However, Enoch understood that this would only draw more attention from Roosevelt. He decided that the best strategy was to win in court. This time, however, luck turned away from Nucky. At the age of 58, Johnson found himself not above, but outside the law for the first time. He was found guilty of tax evasion on August 1, 1941, and was sentenced to 10 years in prison and fined $20,000. Naturally, his lawyers immediately appealed, but this only delayed the sentence, allowing Enoch to marry a second time. That woman was Florence Osbeck, the only one with whom Nucky had been able to build a long-term relationship since the death of his first wife, Mabel. Johnson handed over his power over the city and the Republican political machine to Frank Farley, who successfully convinced others that he was worthy of the unofficial position. Having settled his affairs, Nucky went to prison. He was sent to Lewisburg, where he received a warm welcome due to his connections with Chicago. Enoch was protected in prison by the outfit, but by and large, 
Even the mob's help wasn't needed for Johnson to serve his time in peace. His fame preceded him, and the patronage deeds he performed over 30 years at the helm of Atlantic City touched many residents. Nucky was a respected member of the community and was listened to, even prompting the warden to ask him to encourage inmates to pursue education. Thanks to Johnson, many left Lewisburg during those years with new career prospects. Enoch himself was released from prison before serving half of his sentence. In 1945, after four years in prison, he was released on parole for good behavior. Many thought he would try to regain his position and power, but Johnson chose a different path. He decided to live a quieter life. After filing for bankruptcy to avoid paying a court-ordered fine, Enoch's main income for the rest of his life came from his advertising agent's salary and his wife's income. Whether he still had savings from his golden days is not known, but at least the authorities could not prove their existence. Now, he lived the life of an ordinary citizen, walking along the waterfront, going to restaurants, and hosting friends for dinner were all things Enoch had to take care of during the last 20 years of his life. In the summer of 1968, he asked his wife to move him to a nursing home to receive care after breaking his leg. On December 9th of that year, he died in the ward of that institution of natural causes. At the time of his death, Nucky was 85 years old. This was the story of Enoch Nucky Johnson, a man on both sides of the law. Whether his fate was dictated by his environment or by his own choices is something everyone must decide for themselves. If you enjoyed the story of the enigmatic Nucky Johnson, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more gripping tales from history's underworld. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for watching.